Now we'll start talking about guilty. Now the first, uh, the first point uh, is that guilty only applies to CFCs and their U.S. shareholders. If we have, uh, I think we had on the uh, board last week an example of where an individual owned 40% of a, of a foreign company and some other foreign person owned 60%. Okay, that's not a CFC. The CFC definition that we're talking about when we talk about guilty is the same CFC definition that we know and love from subpart F. And that's more than 50% US shareholder ownership by vote or value. And the US shareholders have to own either directly, indirectly, or by uh, construction, uh, constructive uh, rules, 10% uh, or more of the uh, foreign corporation. And I don't remember that I necessarily mentioned this, but under the CFC rules and this as well, all of it is on a foreign corporation by foreign corporation basis. There's no consolidation of a bunch of foreign corporations. Okay, now yes, if some of those foreign entities are disregarded entities, that's something else. But for any foreign corporations which are treated as corporations, you know, after applying the 7701 entity classification rules, it's a foreign corporation by foreign corporation determination. Yes, uh, Jen. I was reading a little bit, and it was kind of confusing how the um, constructive ownership rules work, and I guess they changed it said a little bit. They're worse now. Uh, the amount of boning that there has been from the elimination of one clause, uh, you're referring to the elimination of uh, 958B4. Why do corporations the, the um, constructive ownership? Uh, anyway, uh, this is this is something that is a morass that I think will is best avoided uh, here. If uh, some of you are interested in it, I'm glad to discuss it outside of uh, class. But the the section and there's plenty of articles on this 958b4 elimination, and it's possible that in uh, the technical corrections will come back a bit on it. So it's it's an in process issue. Now notice uh, I say here that the mechanism is an income inclusion in the hands of each U.S. shareholder measured by the CFC's guilty. If we look at Section 250, which uh, we were talking about before, where it said 37.5% is going to be the deduction, and then Jen pointed out, but what about this 50%? And I said, okay, that 50% 50, 50 applies to guilty. You've got to think about the picture of the U.S. shareholder and the foreign corporation and the U.S. shareholder uh, and whatever business it conducts itself. If that U.S. shareholder owns the factory, and manufactures products and sells overseas because that U.S. shareholder is a U.S. person. It's including in its tax return all of the revenues, all of the expenses. They're already there. And all that needs to be added to give this benefit is this extra deduction, 37.5% of the calculated uh, amount. On the other hand, with guilty, the income is down in the CFC. The income is inside the foreign corporation. It's not income and expenses already inside the U.S. shareholder. And again, we've talked probably ad nauseum about the fact that the U.S. shareholder is the one that can be grabbed. You're within reach. 
Uh, Lou Neal uh, is uh, in the back. I can't reach her. Yeah, too far away. Yeah, it's hard to collect tax from a CFC. So again, the mechanism is grab the US person that owns the CFC and get the tax money from, from that US person. OK, so if the income and expenses are inside the CFC, then we need a mechanism to get income recognition within the US shareholder. That's 951A. That's 951A. The mechanism to recognize an amount of income within the US shareholder, which is calculated in a particular manner, then Section 250 says, OK, you've included, let's say, 100 of guilty in income. Now we're going to give you a deduction which is equal to 50% of a calculated amount, which uh, in most cases is going to be 50 of that 100, leaving you with taxable income of 50, giving you a 10.5% effective tax rate. This is where it's coming from. So you've got different mechanisms in the code. In FDII, you only need the deduction because the income and expenses are already in the US person. With guilty, because the income and expenses are in the CFC, which is outside of US taxing jurisdiction, you need a mechanism, which is 951 cap A, to bring that income, to bring some calculated amount of income up to the US shareholder, and then to result in that effective 10.5% rate, you get a deduction. Yeah, I'd, rec I'd recommend that you look through the, the slides uh, in terms of uh, how this works and refer uh, to the code sections uh, just to get an idea of what this stuff looks like. You're not going to remember how this thing works. It's more a sense of if it becomes important to you later, whether it's the, the time of the uh, final paper for this course or hopefully in uh, some job you're in in the future, you'll know where to look and you'll be able to go through this stuff. What you want to walk away with, if possible, is this big picture thing of why we're, we're getting to these rough results of you know, 10.5% as being the effective tax rate, how this compares with FDII. Now, one thing which, again, is, a, uh, I think, a, a big picture item that is important to uh, walk away with uh, is what comes first, subpart F income or guilty? Now remember we talked about different categories of subpart F income. Foreign personal holding company income, foreign based company sales income, foreign based company services income. We talked about those categories. Because the guilty computation, just like the FDII one, is an overall thing. You know, what's the total income of the foreign corporation? And then we subtract off this, you know, this 10% of QBI, the qualified business uh, asset investment, qualified business asset investment. Because of that overall calculation, we would be perhaps including the same income twice. If we have some foreign-based company sales income, and that is also included in the, the guilty computation, which again is sort of total income minus the 10% of QBI, we need to understand that there's no double counting because that starting point of total income of the subsidiary 
gets reduced by any subpart F income. So that means that subpart F comes first. And whatever is remaining after subpart F is applied, that becomes the, the amount of income which you then subtract off 10% of Q by to come up with your amount of guilty. Uh, to uh, make the point again that individual U.S. shareholders, uh, I think the technical term is they get clobbered. They have to include any income from guilty if they're a 10% you know, or greater shareholder, but they do not get the Section 250 deduction. Only corporate shareholders get that. And then, of course, secondly, they do not get any benefit from foreign tax credits. Now, I've glossed over, because of the complications involved, trying to discuss, again, the foreign tax credit in this guilty context. But there is some important benefit to a corporate shareholder of taking the foreign tax credit. Uh, for those of you who are interested in seeing exactly how the computations work, I've included on the course website uh, at least a couple of articles by uh, uh, Marty Sullivan, who has set out and even provided uh, a, an Excel spreadsheet that shows the computations. Uh, it's something I would only recommend you get into if you are specifically interested in it. So an individual, uh, in addition to no Section 250 deduction, no deemed paid tax credit, application of the 3.8% net investment uh, income uh, uh, add-on, this really places the individual in a very rough position because he has this income without deductions or foreign tax credit at a time when he has no cash to pay the tax. There is relief. I mentioned it last, uh, last week, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, referring, or maybe the week, yeah, last week, I think, uh, referring to the 962 election, where there's some relief. The individual can calculate his tax uh, using corporate rates and the foreign tax credit and also the Section 250 deduction, which was provided for in proposed regulations that were issued shortly after this class session. Uh, as if he were a corporation. So his tax obligation in the year, on a year-by-year -year basis will go down, but at some point in the future when he uh, either gets a dividend or maybe sells the, uh, the shares uh, and realizes gain, uh, some of which will be treated as if it were a dividend. Uh, he then gets clobbered with the rest of the tax. Individual shareholders are not favored in this uh, environment. Uh, I knew there was uh, an example somewhere uh, uh, just to go very briefly through it, okay, assume facts. Uh, corporate U.S. shareholder owns 100%. Uh, gross income, less expenses of 100. We're assuming that it has no subpart F income, so there's no subtraction for subpart F income or several other categories that you find in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, code section, 951 Cap A. I'm assuming the CFC pays 10 of foreign income taxes, uh, that the CFC has uh, Q by, again, qualified business asset investment of 200. Uh, and then uh, notice uh, this item here, uh, U.S. shareholder has expenses allocable to guilty of 20. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that when we get uh, a little farther in this. We take our uh, gross income less expenses we said was 100. 
we subtract off our tenant foreign taxes and we have something called tested income. Tested income is a term used uh, in the code section. And notice that this tested income is essentially the equivalent of earnings and profits that we've talked about. Earnings and profits. What, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, the ability uh, to pay a dividend. But this is not actually earnings and profits. There's not adjustments for, for example, you know, uh, capital losses that, uh, that uh, would not be allowed uh, in the computation or other items that uh, uh, would not be appropriate income and expenses. This is based on what is taxable income and what's taxable expense under U.S. rules. Okay, we then subtract off the 10% of the QBI and we come down with guilty of 70. So this is, this 70, this is the amount which is going to be included in the income of the shareholder under section 951 cap A. That's the inclusion in the U.S. shareholder's income. We then look at the foreign taxes and we need to calculate, and I won't walk through the, what the numbers are, but we just need to calculate how much is the deemed paid credit out of that 10 of foreign tax, and we calculate it as 6.22. And secondly, how much is the Section 78 gross up? Remember what the Section 78 gross up is. That's where you have to add back the taxes deemed paid to get to the appropriate amount of income so that you get the intended result of the foreign tax credit mechanism. Again, we've talked about that before. I, I won't uh, attempt to re-explain it here, it's, but it's an important part of this. Now, notice in, the, in this example, you'll see that the 78 gross up amount is 7.78, the 960D deemed paid foreign tax credit is less. This is a, another reason why I say this is hit with a sledgehammer. There's more income being included in the US shareholders income then there is deemed paid credit. Normally, they should be exactly the same. Here, there's a difference. Okay, when we look at the U.S. shareholder's tax calculation, okay, he had to include guilty of 70. He has to add on the Section 78 gross up. Comes to a total. Subtract off the 250 deduction, which was what Jen found when she saw that, uh, gee, what's this 50% uh, that I had to come over and look at to see what it was. Subtract off the 50%. And the net amount included then is 38.89 additional taxable income times 21% gives us 8.17. We then look at our calculation of the uh, actual tax and we say, okay, uh, we know we have to subtract off foreign tax credit, so uh, we have to calculate our foreign tax credit limitation. And again, uh, we're not going through the details of, uh, of this except please you know, look through this on your own. Uh, we see that the foreign tax limitation at the end of the foreign tax credit limitation at the end of the day is 3.97, despite the fact that the available foreign tax credit is 6.22. Now, what's an important part of this? I mentioned before that there were U.S. shareholder expenses allocable to guilty of 20. Okay, what does that mean? If a corporation, let's say any big corporation, whether it's uh, Apple, whether it's Caterpillar, you know, anyone, they've got a big management structure, they've got R&D going on, they've got 
uh, interest costs. They've got all sorts of things happening within the U.S. company. You know that the foreign tax credit limitation formula is U.S. tax before foreign tax credit times foreign source taxable income over worldwide taxable income. And when you calculate that foreign source taxable income, well, gee, what about interest expense at the parent level? What about R&D costs at the parent level? What about allocated management costs that benefit the foreign subsidiaries? Those things can reduce the amount of foreign source taxable income. So we started with that net guilty inclusion of 38.89, which was uh, on the prior slide, net inclusion in U.S. shareholder income, 38.89. We start with that, but we say, gee, we've calculated through another terribly complicated calculation, 20, as being the expenses, aliquid, the expenses of the U.S. parent that are allocable against this guilty income. That causes our net our foreign source taxable income for the formula to fall. And when that falls, that reduces the available foreign tax credit limitation. U.S. tax before credit times foreign source taxable income over worldwide taxable income. The worldwide taxable income remains the same. This 20 doesn't affect it. The 20 only affects the foreign source taxable income. It reduces it, and as a result, our limitation falls significantly. This issue of how that 20 is calculated uh, was a very controversial matter, and relatively recently, uh, the IRS came out with proposed regulations of how to calculate this, and there's, there's still a lot of uh, uh, belly aching and moaning about this issue. Because without that 20, this 3.98 would have been much higher. And uh, as a result, when we go to the end of the day and say, gee, what's the U.S. tax payable after the foreign tax credit, we would have had a very small number, but now we have this 480, which is, relatively speaking, much higher. This issue of allocation of expenses of the U.S. parent against the guilty inclusion, that is a, let's say, a major conceptual issue to at least be aware of and hopefully uh, walk away from this course with. Again, we've mentioned when we talked about the foreign tax credit uh, rules before, we said that the carry back and carry over for this separate category of guilty, there is none. No carry back, no carry forward. The foreign tax credit not allowed is lost forever. So this is a, a major economic issue to multinationals as they uh, attempt to calculate the effect of guilty on their situations. And notice that the result of putting now together, you know, economically just looking at total taxes of both companies, uh, the U.S. parent and the foreign sub, they've paid a total of 14.8, uh, the U.S. company paying 4.8, and the uh, foreign company paying 10. The total on the 100 of pre-tax income, which we used in our example, gives a 14.8 effective tax rate. And you may recall that I kept saying, well, gee, the tax rate is 10.5%. Well, yeah, the tax, the tax rate is 10.5% in theory, but it will not necessarily work out that way. So here's an example where, with this particular circumstance, it came to 14.8. There's nothing magic about this 14.8. It could have been 20%. It could have been uh, some other percentage. It's just how the numbers work out 
Uh, but the factors that are going to be important are going to be how much foreign tax there is, and secondly, uh, how much, especially how much expense has to be allocated from other things against the guilty inclusion, that 20 that we used in the example. Uh, there's just a, I, I wrote down, uh, you know, additional complicating factors. There's a lot of complicating factors. Again, just scan through it to get a flavor. And I've indicated some uh, articles and such. Uh, uh, the Marty, uh, Marty Sullivan is the one I mentioned, the user-friendly guilty spreadsheet. I believe there's even a newer one since this uh, June 4th dates, uh, and it will be in the uh, course website. Uh, I should add, uh, going back, the one at the bottom or, and also uh, higher up, Jasper Cummings, uh, he writes a lot on these subjects. Uh, his articles can be, uh, can be useful if you, again, want to get into the 